in shaping housing design and the role of housing design in the health and well being of residents. Christina's recent research has been published by the Journal of Property Management Reducing Apartment Vacancy Duration Lessons from Affordable Housing and Buildings Research and Information Decoupling Climate Policy Objectives and Mechanisms to Reduce Fragmentation. In 2020, Christina was awarded funding from the AIA Housing and Community Development Knowledge Community for a study entitled Measuring Success that examines the role of varying forms of post-occupancy evaluation in the professional practice of housing design. Christina has presented peer-reviewed papers at the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, ACSA, and the Architectural Research Center's Consortium, ARCC, conferences on her current research, which focuses on the design of permanent supportive housing in the United States and Canada. She is an at-large board member of ARCC. Amanda D'Onofrio is principal at Bergs, Bergs, Bergsland Delaney Architecture and Planning, PC, which she joined in 2010. After relocating to Eugene, Oregon from, from Chicago, she was happy to find that her years of previous experience in affordable housing were an ideal fit for Bergsland Delaney. In her years dedicated to the creation of well-designed affordable housing options throughout Oregon and Illinois, she has been involved in projects varying in size from single family homes to a 106 unit project for independent seniors. Her projects have been both in rural and dense urban areas. Regardless of the project size or location, she is committed to investigating the most appropriate sustainable strategies to increase energy efficiency and create tighter building envelopes while staying within the project budget. Amanda is also the go-to for accessibility questions within the office and enjoys discussing ways to go beyond code depending on the population served in her housing projects. Amanda graduated from the University of Illinois in Chicago with her Bachelor of Arts in Architectural Studies in 2004 and received her Master of Architecture from the same institution in 2006. She is a licensed architect in both Oregon and Illinois. With that, I will turn it over to Amanda and Christina. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you to everyone for being here tonight for our presentation. Um, we're here to share our research practice collaboration, but before we begin, uh, we would like to get a sense of who you are um, and who we are talking to. So uh, feel free on the Zoom poll to fill out as many of these categories as apply to you. Um, and it will just help us understand who's our audience tonight, right? These Zoom lectures are so different than being in person. So I'll give you a couple seconds to fill that out. Um, I'm going to tell you in tonight's presentation, we are going to explain the process through which Amanda and I work together and the built and occupied now outcome of our collaboration. Um, we were really excited by the timing of this lecture uh, because it enabled the building to um, be completed, be photographed, um, and most importantly, people have moved in, which you'll hear a lot about um, tonight. So I'm just gonna end the poll now um, and share the results. And we'll see that 82% of you um, describe yourself um, as designers. Uh, and 42% researchers, some housers out there, power to the housers, um, advocates, activists, and 70% believe in the social good. So I think you're in the right place tonight. So we're excited to, to share our work with you. So uh, first we'll introduce ourselves just a little bit more in context of the presentation. Let me get all of my slides in order here. All right. So as um, Lynn introduced me, and as many of you know um, from my courses here, I'm an assistant professor in the health and well-being focus area. And in my career as an architect, I designed several buildings for people who had experienced long-term homelessness. These buildings, which we call permanent supportive housing, um, or PSH, you'll hear us use for short, provide fully autonomous apartments in addition to common areas for gathering, offices, and other activities. These buildings also include spaces for social workers, nurses, specialists to, who can work with residents to recover from the mental and physical effects of living outside. 
As an example, on the left side of the slide is Kenyon House, uh, which is a permanent supportive housing building that I designed in Seattle. When I started teaching here at Illinois in 2017, I taught a studio that focused on this project type. In the center are grad students visiting a permanent supportive housing building for veterans in Danville, Illinois. And on the right is Sean Waddell presenting his PSH design at midterm. So permanent supportive housing was a very important part of my work as an architect um, and of my teaching, but it wasn't a focus of my research until Amanda and I started collaborating um, in 2017. Hi, I am Amanda D'Onofrio, and I'm a principal at BDA Architecture and Planning in Eugene, Oregon. We did officially change our name at the beginning of 2021, which will make it a lot easier as I do a little bit more of these discussions in the future. But we're a small firm of six people, and we specialize in multifamily affordable housing. We work primarily with nonprofit organizations and local housing authorities that are developing housing through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And so we have been interested in applied research, but with our small size, we had really limited capacity to conduct and integrate it on an ongoing basis. And so this relationship with Christina has been invaluable to the work that I began to do about four years ago. So back in 2017, when I started to design the first housing first PSH project for our firm, I knew this building type would be different than many of the affordable housing projects we'd worked on, but I couldn't quantify how. One of the very first questions I had is how much of the building area would be given to common area and office area. And so I asked this of Christina who could find evidence that the typical recommended ratio of net rentable area to gross area in market rate housing is 82%. And so I conducted some calculations of projects within our firm's portfolio and found that we were coming up with 70 to 75% for our typical affordable housing projects. This same statistic wasn't out there for PSH. And so not only were Christina and I curious, but we knew that this was information that would help support our client in discussions with our state's housing department and potential funders when trying to understand reasons why PSH might cost more than other multifamily affordable housing. So we studied 12 permanent supportive housing buildings built works across the US and Canada. And this came out of the precedent studies that my students did in that studio um, my first year here. We analyzed floor plans and photographs to understand how each common area in these PSH projects were used. We calculated the floor area of each and traced paths through the diagrams to understand how the space was layered. And here you can see some of the data, the color-coded plans of the buildings. Green is outdoor space, of course. Uh, blue are common spaces for gathering. The darker the blue, the more people we would expect to move through the space. And the yellow and um, light yellow, dark yellow colors are the offices for social services. So we took each of these plans and created a similar diagram. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my slides, but I think I'm going to make it here. OK, thank you. Sorry. Um, so we then took these calculations, um, so floor areas of each of the, of the spaces, as well as the space dedicated to the apartments, and we found that the PSH projects we studied ranged from about 33% um, at the low end to 64% net residential area. So that means that the, the dwellings are only taking up 33 to 64% of the total building area, and the mean that we found was 54%. So as you can see, compared to that 70 to 75% for a typical affordable housing project that Amanda found, these buildings have a lot more common area, at least the ones built in recent years. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this part of um, our work, at the end of the lecture, I will drop a link in the chat um, to one of these papers. And so after collecting and analyzing those recently built permanent supportive housing projects, it became easier to support the additional area of this building given over to common and office space. We included two significant common spaces, uh, one being a community room and one being a lounge. So two separate multi-purpose rooms in what we refer to as our residential common wing. These are areas um, also shown in blue in our diagrams on the north. 
There's 24 seven staffing in the building that resulted in a large part of the first floor being devoted to our supportive service staff. Much of that is in the supportive service wing to the south, but peer support is in the residential common area. And so peers are social workers with lived experience of homelessness, and we felt that locating them close to where residents would spend time was a good pairing for the trust building that needs to happen when residents choose to seek services. In the end, the net to gross ratio at MLK is 54%, which as Christina mentioned, is the mean that we found in our analysis. And so the next question I had was about the design of the apartment itself. Um, as I mentioned, our firm has an extensive history in affordable housing, and we have a catalog of ones, twos, threes, and even four bedroom units to start from when we think about our housing projects. What we didn't have in our portfolio at the time was a studio unit. And so the minimum square footage for a studio unit dictated by Oregon Housing and Community Services is 350 square feet. So a question that interested both Christina and I is how we could maximize potential in the design of a studio unit. Like what are the layers of space that can exist in these small units? What's the typical zoning within a unit? And how much area is dedicated to each of these zones? We also wanted to know how my required unit area compared against the pool of projects we'd originally studied and other PSH projects that we'd identified throughout North America. So we expanded that initial study pool um, and moved from 12 buildings to 23. And we looked at, therefore, 23 studio apartments. There, are, I also want to mention there are one bedroom units occasionally in, in permanent supportive housing. But as Amanda was intending to use studio, apart, studio apartments, that's all that we studied. And you can see here on this matrix um, some of the kind of groupings and categories that we found in terms of layout, um, in terms of the size of the apartments. We found that the net area of uh, the apartments ranges from 236 to 345 square feet, and the mean of the sample was 303 square feet. We also analyzed um, these components. So you can see it's a little bit fuzzy on here. Again, I can, I'm going to drop a link um, to the full um, to the full study in case you're interested, but we, we really noticed these trends be between um, some that had entries, some that did not, some that had kitchens as part of the living room, some that did not. So we, we were starting to uncover these patterns as we looked at more and more projects. And so as we dug into our unit study, I thought the number of patterns we found in our pool of studios was pretty interesting. But the timing of our unit study didn't coincide with the opportunity for me to revise our unit at the Commons on MLK. Both my owner and I were pretty happy with the efficient little studio unit that we had for MLK, um, but I still went ahead and shared the chart with her from the previous slide. And we both liked the idea of refining the unit design to add a little entry area within the unit for our next project. And so, so the plan on this slide is the studio, the studio unit for the Nell, which is another PSH project that we're working on in Eugene. It's currently in the final stages of plan review and it's due to start construction in early June. So after we finished these two studies, Amanda asked me what um, we call a wicked question in research. What is trauma-informed design and how does it relate to trauma-informed care? So during our schematic design phase, we had toured buildings with our client. And as all of the architects know, this is a pretty typical tool for architects and project teams to work with when we're trying to understand precedents. What made these tours particularly great is that we attended with our client, Homes for Good. They brought along their property management staff and some of their partners from the Human Services Department at Lane County. The tours through the buildings were led by service providers and on-site managers. And so it led to really great conversations with our team from the beginning. And our developer was really committed to getting me at the table early to get design input from various service providers, even though they hadn't selected their partner for the project. And so in these earliest conversations, I was introduced to the concept of trauma-informed care and asked how trauma-informed care principles could inform building design. And so this partnership with Christina provided me someone to bounce this question around with and to dig deeper to understand. The literature review I conducted when Amanda asked me this question revealed that the incidence of previous trauma is very high 
amongst those who've experienced long-term homelessness. In fact, there is growing evidence that the experience of trauma can be a cause of long-term homelessness. And for the researchers in the room, I do not use the word cause lately. Um, there's such, such a high level of incidence of trauma that um, they think it may be one of the contributing factors. But this, this connection between trauma and homelessness is really twofold. Um, it's, a, it's a double, um, there's a double effect. And in this diagram, I'm illustrating that relationship between homelessness and trauma and, and almost a multiplier effect. The experience of living on shelter can itself be traumatic because there's nothing easy or safe or comforting about living or sleeping outside. And it can be physically and psychologically dangerous. Thus, by the time people are finally able to access permanent, permanent housing, their risk of trauma is double. So the initial traumas before they were first homeless and then the tra trauma of homelessness itself. So the trauma-informed care model aims to provide a sense of safety and empowerment. And we recognize that the building needs to support this mission for the residents who've experienced previous trauma and the staff whose role it is to be available for these residents. To incorporate TIC into the design of a building, we try to understand what design elements may be triggers for trauma and understand the mental health impacts of design choices. We attempted to make design decisions that would minimize stress and increase feelings of safety. But most importantly, we engaged with people who had lived experience of homelessness to provide perspective on how to respond to the trauma of long-term homelessness in our design. The more you learn about trauma-informed care, the more that you understand the importance of that work being tenant-led. To be trauma-informed in the design, it was important for our design process to include these representative voices. So through some more research, um, I found actually very little about trauma-informed design. At the time, uh, the only trauma-informed design principles were from the Committee for Emergency Shelter, which is a nonprofit in Vermont. Their principles are listed on this slide, and you can see the direct connection from the values of trauma-informed care that Amanda showed on the previous slide, like safety, sense of control, transparency. And while many in the audience tonight will recognize connect to the natural world, um, as a health and well-being principle, it still felt like these principles were a little too abstract to design a building by. Since designers are typically more comfortable with design patterns than principles, we adapted the trauma-informed design principles combined with the care principles to develop a set of replicable patterns. These patterns are tools for designers to use in innovative and original ways to create trauma-informed environments. In the next section, we'll demonstrate through research and design how these patterns are manifest in permanent supportive housing to assist with residents' recovery. We'll step through each of the patterns in order, providing spatial choice, connecting to nature, including natural light, allocating space for de-escalation, designing clear paths, incorporating resident input, and designing for all senses. For each pattern, Christina will show how we found the patterns in existing buildings, and I will show how I designed with the patterns in a new PSH building in Eugene, Oregon. So as we began the process of testing these patterns, um, we learned about three buildings in Seattle um, with Plymouth Housing Group um, that were undergoing renovations that were trauma-informed renovations. Um, and so we were curious about these and decided to visit them as we were testing our patterns. We also read in our, in our initial studies about a project in um, Denver called Sanderson, which was in our original group of 12 um, projects um, that used explicit trauma-informed design. And as we learned a little bit more about that project, um, I decided to visit it as well to try to understand how the patterns that, that Amanda and I were developing were at work um, in these three projects. So three of them on the left, renovations of just the common areas, and the one on the right is a new construction um, uh, in Denver. And so as we were testing these patterns in the real world, I was incorporating them into our firm's first PSH project. This is Lane County's first low barrier project serving individuals who've experienced chronic homelessness. As we continue to discuss the patterns, Christina will note what we learned from the existing projects, and I will show how we incorporated the patterns into this 
recently completed 51 unit project. Um, while we present each pattern individually, you'll notice through images that these patterns are actually laying over each other in spaces throughout the building. So the first pattern is to provide spatial choice for both organized and casual social engagements. The multi-purpose rooms we saw at the Plymouth Housing Projects are single rooms with multiple programs. The examples we saw all host all these functions within the space on a pretty much regular basis. They are a TV lounge, a library, a computer lab, an indoor garden, music rooms with pianos, coffee station, food pantry, all at once. They are hubs of activity and the various functions are bringing different people into the room at different times of the day. At Sanderson, they take spatial choice in another direction by providing a multitude of rooms for very explicit uses. The various activities you would find in one Plymouth common room each have independent rooms at the Sanderson project spread throughout the three-story building. At the Commons and MLK, we have provided for multiple types and sizes of common areas, but with flexible programming. We see the lounge being TD, library, and games, while the community room would host art therapy, yoga, or nutrition discussions, while also being a daily place to maybe find a coffee or food donations. The group meeting room is a controlled access room that could be available for resident use when it's not scheduled for mixed staff and resident meetings. The team wanted 24-7 access to computers, so the lab space is open to the hall in this project. Well, it was intentional for us to provide the primary common areas on the first floor that was to activate this part of the building and allow for staff observation and interaction. We wanted to make places for social engagement that could be organized or happen casually and fit residents changing needs as moods and preferences shift. A resident can find privacy within their dwelling unit or they can have a guest for a coffee or a meal. Outside of the unit, each residential floor has a small common nook near the elevator lobby. It felt really important to the team to have a space on these upper floors for a resident to leave their unit without having to go down to the first floor. Connecting to the outdoors can be both direct and indirect. You can connect to the outdoors by being in it or by looking at it from inside the building. Safe outdoor spaces that can, can be used across the seasons can be very helpful in, in reducing the effects of trauma. At Sanderson on the right, a large south and west facing outdoor area is protected from the street and has areas of shade and sun, plantings, and hardscape. At Plymouth on Stewart, an outdoor space is not available, so residents tend to plant wall in the main first floor common area as a screen from the hectic street and sidewalk beyond. The trauma informed renovation money provided shelving and volunteers provided the plants. Understanding the importance of access to nature, particularly as people who have experienced chronic homelessness transition into housing, a secure outdoor courtyard is a critical element of this building's program. Our primary resident common room and our quiet room exit into this space and many of the dwelling units are looking onto it. Connecting to nature from inside the building was also a priority. The units, corridor windows, meeting rooms and even our stairs are looking out onto our courtyard or the surrounding greenery of the campus the building is situated in. The common areas of the renovation projects did not have extensive access to daylight, but at the Scargo, changes made the, the changes they made made the most of the visual connections. It's on the picture on the left. At Sanderson on the right, I have an exterior picture and an interior picture here. There's a double, double height art and activity space on the northeast corner of the building that brings both daylight and sunlight and connects the residents to the seasons. And when I just as an anecdote, when I was visiting, I said, oh, are there art classes and things happening in here as, as it says in, in all the articles? And, and the woman said, no, people play chess here. So even in a building that had as many tiny spaces dedicated to very specific uses, the residents are still um, having the, the um, autonomy to decide what happens in the different rooms. So all of the residential common areas in the Commons and MLK feature either an interior light or a glazing in the entry door. Allowing the residents to see inside of a room before they enter allows an understanding of what is happening inside of a room and it allows somebody to decide to engage which can help reduce anxiety. 
This also allows staff to take stock of situations inside rooms and consider how to engage to ensure safety for staff and consumers. The interior glazing has the added benefit of borrowing natural light into other spaces. Light quality is really important, especially natural light, and it can make spaces feel less crowded and also improve moods. The first floor of Sanderson has a circular plan and not a high level of horizontal and vertical transparency. The photo on the left, um, you can see the reception desk and you can see how the staff member um, working there can see up through the atrium and then they can also move through the lobby easily from either side of the reception desk and they can pass quickly and easily into the office area behind. There are two doors to the lobby you can see on the plan. Uh, I think you can see my mouse um, here. There's a vestibule in here. One of them leads to the street and the other uh, leads to the courtyard and the alley beyond. So if a tenant needs to avoid another resident, uh, they can, um, or if they want to avoid a staff member, they can. Because this is housing first, um, the services are not required. Uh, and so sometimes someone doesn't want to uh, meet with a caseworker and they can exit the building in multiple directions. There are no pinch points either on the first floor plan of Sanderson. So there aren't spaces that, that have um, uh, blind corners as you move around um, the spaces. And so that adds to the sense of security. In a trauma-informed environment, it is important to recognize that as artists were trying to minimize the possibility, situations or environments can trigger a reaction to a previous incidence of trauma. We aim to respond by providing a feeling of safety for both the staff and the residents throughout the project. This is largely accomplished by providing two doors in spaces that would host one-on-one -on -one tenant interactions. This allows someone to remove themselves from a situation quickly if their safety feels compromised. In the residential common area, we also created a quiet room for staff to meet residents where they are at and assist with de-escalation after an episode. The inclusion of this quiet room in the residential common wing resulted from feedback from our local lived experience user group. The stair you can see on the right um, in Sanderson is not one of the two required egress stairs for the building. It's extra. And it's a feature Amanda and I took to calling central third stair as we found it in, um, in some of the projects we looked at in the first days of our research. Because it's extra, uh, it can be at the center of the building. It doesn't need to be at each end of the corridor and it can be more open. The architects at Sanderson and Kate in glass, so there is 100% visibility. Each person who com comes in can see in and out as they traverse the building. The circulation overall is open, linear, and easy, easily navigable with wide corridors and no confined spaces, as I mentioned previously. But the stair really adds to this because it's at the very center of the building and all of the other circulation revolves around it. In that photo on the left at Plymouth on Stewart, um, the trauma-informed uh, renovations enhance the colors and lighting and reception area to provide a very clear path to the elevator and stair. This brought the elevator visually closer to the front door and lobby, even though, of course, it remained toward the back of the building. At MLK, we aim to provide clear sight lines in our circulation spaces. Color and windows at the end of each corridor help differentiate the ends and the knuckle of each floor, where you find the elevators, our third stair, and a nook. Wide corridors help reduce the feeling of overcrowding, and this also helps residents with mobility impairments move with ease and allows for some social interaction. We incorporated small-scale articulation to break the 17 unit floors into unit clusters, which became a place for us to introduce color in the corridors. The use of distinct colors for wayfinding makes navigating a building more intuitive and allows for residents to recall all floors by colors rather than numbers. Soliciting and listening to resident input was an essential element for the renovations, uh, the trauma-informed renovations from the very start of the process. Each building had a committee of residents responsible for setting priorities and making decisions. The committee also worked to involve all residents by leaving prospective paint colors or furniture or fabric samples at the front desk for feedback from other interested residents who weren't on the committee. In the two examples from the Plymouth projects I show here, I feel like they really exemplify the importance of resident voice. On the left at St. Charles, residents wanted ensconced lighting on the walls in the TV room rather than the magnetic ballast fluorescent lights you can see turned off in the photo. 
And at first there was some pushback because it is difficult to install sconce lighting in the basement of a century old masonry building. But the residents pushed back and the sconce lights were wired with conduit on the face of the wall. Maybe not everyone's ideal architectural solution, but when I was in this space, every sconce light was turned on and not a single fluorescent light was on. The photo on the right shows the wall of resident portraits at Stewart, a request from this building's committee. Interestingly, the other two buildings with trauma-informed renovations do not have walls of resident photos, which to me shows the power of resident voice and the specificity of resident voice in shaping the culture of each building and community. The key question our team asked was, how do we incorporate tenant voice in a new construction building? So we had engaged our local lived experience user group that serves as an advisory group to our city's poverty and homelessness board during schematic design. So when the time came to make decisions on color and furnishings, the owner reconnected with League to include this representative voice for the selection process. A survey was the tool that they recommended would be the most effective for getting their input on color palettes, the use and extent of color in spaces and furniture types for the units and the common areas. All of the furniture presented to the group was aiming to balance soft or cozy with bed bug resistance. So the final pattern we will discuss tonight is limit sensory overload, but allow for sensory delight. And um, this story is exemplified um, by one of the most important resident priorities at Scargo, which was related to sensory overload. Before the renovation, there was an opening to a building tall trash chute in the, in the common area. And this was very overwhelming to the residents, the smell, the odor, and not especially helpful to the maintenance workers as they typically carried the trash out of the room. So during the renovation, the chute was closed off at this level. Um, in this room that you see on the left and the shaft that surrounds it um, is painted blue, a color chosen by the, by the committee. And now it anchors a table in the room for games or puzzles. And then on the other side of the room, a picture you saw earlier um, is the idea of sensory delight through the screen of windows with a view across the alley. Um, but the reason I want to include the picture is to see that color, the blue again. So they chose one color as an accent in the room, but not a bunch of different colors, um, which would likely lead to sensory overload. At MLK, our courtyard is one of the places that best exemplifies sensory delight. Um, it is full of multiple colorful plant beds. And by request of the service provider and the owner, the landscape architect eliminated red plants as red can be overstimulating. These planters and plant beds create small outdoor rooms in the larger courtyard area so people can choose to be alone if they want to. One sub area has raised beds for hands-on planting. And the courtyard includes a water feature which is really quite soothing when you are in this space. The courtyard is bounded by a fence which was a long topic of conversation. We wanted to maintain a sense of privacy for residents using the space but didn't want something completely visually obscuring. The fence needed to be affordable, but our lived experience user group had cautioned that chain link is a triggering material and we committed to avoiding its use on the project. We decided on an aluminum fence system with greenery that will grow in as a buffer and eventually enclose the space. So while explaining this process one pattern at a time is helpful to understand, different places in the building present multiple patterns at once. And one of these places is the stairwell. And so we had heard crevices or spaces that feel dark or shadowy, including stairwells, can trigger previous trauma as they could have been predatory places in someone's history. Sometimes architects treat these circulation spaces as just the exit stair and don't give them much attention. We wanted to make even our exit stairs more inviting to use. We aim to provide clear sight lines within each stairwell and included windows at each level and intermediate landing to bring natural light in and provide views back out to the outside green space. Each door has a vision light in the stairway and at the third stair, we included windows to each floor that allow residents and staff to easily see who is coming or going before entering. The third stair is open at the ground floor to encourage its use and further enhance the feeling of safety by not enclosing it at the main level. The use of different cool colors known to be calming makes wayfinding more intuitive when using this mode of circulation. 
So the intent of our talk tonight was to share the results of our research practice collaboration um, and the, the ways we've been able to look at trauma-informed care, look at trauma-informed design, and then how Amanda's been able to apply that research to the building. But we were also motivated to show you how a research practice collaboration can make design richer and research better. Um, we shared the first four steps um, tonight here from this diagram. Amanda asked me those first questions. I did primary and secondary research, then the integration of that research, the actual real building. But there are more steps um, and there's more to come. Our collaboration will continue. Um, though it can be very hard um, for researchers to gain the trust of people who are serving very vulnerable residents, working with Amanda will enable me to study the building in more depth in the post-pandemic future and to report on those findings. And so there's this idea about the collaboration being not only a, a way to enrich a building, but also as a way to enrich research with, with empirical studies that can take place with real human beings in a real building. And I want to note a building where we know all of the design intent. So when I visit Sanderson or I visit the Plymouth the Plymouth, Plymouth resident renovations, I know some of the intentions, but I don't have the same kind of access to intention as when Amanda and I are collaborating. So the next step of this um, is what is how we're going to end the lecture tonight with a few ideas for what else we will be studying in MLK. So these pictures were taken by the service provider shelter care during the volunteer event to put together moving kits for the residents at the Commons and MLK. And as any architect knows getting to the point of move in on a building is huge and particularly with this project and the support and enthusiasm from our community. But Christina and I don't want this research practice collaboration to end with people moving into the building. The big question we intend to tackle is whether these very explicit trauma informed interventions are working for the residents and staff. So some of the sub questions of, of that big question um, are small. So for example, I'm very curious, does the design of the front desk and its location in the building allow for casual and formal, formal interactions between residents and between residents and staff? I'm also curious about how the connection with the natural world in the courtyard may reduce stress or improve mood for people who choose um, to use it. And we could look at the courtyard and think, what about casual and formal interactions there. Are the benches more likely to be used by single people and the groups are more likely to be in another section? Can residents use this during all seasons? These are some of the questions we can't answer until people are actually here and we can talk to them. Some other questions are big. So how do the residents furnish the apartments? How do they respond to our intent to eliminate concealed spaces within units, thinking that that might reduce anxiety by promoting open storage? Can we compare the apartments in MLK and the NAL, where we've introduced a new zone with the entry closet and shifted the window placement in the exterior wall to better define a sleeping area? We have a lot of questions. <laughs> And we hope that you have a lot of questions too. So we will end our presentation here um, in the hopes that you have questions about our collaboration, about permanent supportive housing uh, generally, or, or about trauma-informed design. Thank you very much for being here and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. <laughs>